Bible called this in the back of the room. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone online. I know Denny's watching from his hospital suite in Mercy. Hi, Denny. Hi, Denny. Hi, Denny. Hi, Denny. I saw Becky on there, too, so I'm glad to have everybody here. So, uh, this morning's announcements. Uh, today, uh, we just have a study and prayer this coming Wednesday night at 7. And so, I uh, invite you to join us uh, for that. There will be some music and lots of prayer and a devotional. Um, and I know last week we had a, a devotional from Shannon, and it was very thought-provoking and very much appreciated. So thank you for doing that. We look forward to seeing what's coming up on Wednesday night. Um, really, the only other thing left on the schedule uh, right now is uh, Orange Truck Racing on June 12th. So, got that coming up. It seems like, that actually seems like a ways away. I mean, it seems like it's been a ways away since our last one. So, I'm not, usually they're piled on top of one and it seems like they go boom, boom, boom. But that's a good thing. You need to have a little bit of rest. So, this morning, I forgot the order, too. You're up there. No. No, you're fine. I'm still here. Okay. Mark, I know you're watching. You're good. This is what happens. Give me my coffee. Here we go. All right. So this morning's worship, and you may have all noticed that we changed colors. Um, today is Pentecost, and so uh, today we celebrate that. And Acts two records the events of the birth of the church. That's what Pentecost is to us as Christians. Now, prior to that. Pentecost was 50 days after uh, Passover, and it was a different festival altogether. And um, but here's the thing: Joel, the prophet, he prophesied about Pentecost in chapter 2, 28, 29. This is what the prophet said. He said, "Then, after doing all those things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people." Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on servants, men and women alike. Then we fast forward hundreds of years, and we get to the Last Supper, and Jesus promises the Holy Spirit as he ends his earthly ministry. This is what... Uh, Jesus says in John 14, 15 through 17, he says, If you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. Tying that Old Testament, that, that fabric, that weaving of the Bible from beginning to end. And after the resurrection, Jesus meets his disciples and he tells them in John 20, 22, he says, receive the Holy Spirit. They're the first ones that Jesus tells to receive the Holy Spirit. But then, then after he has ascended into heaven and, and the ministry of the disciples starts to kick in. It was the day of Pentecost. Acts 2, 1 through 4 records it this way. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. The church is born. It's the fulfillment of the prophecy that Joel spoke. And this will ultimately lead perfectly into this morning's um, sermon called You Surrender. Father, as we prepare to hear your message this morning, we pray a blessing on the worship team. We thank them for the gift that you have given them. And Father, we, we come to you and worship as we worship through these songs that we're about to sing, we ask that you would fill us up and let us 
use these words and these songs as a worship that is holy and pleasing to you. Father, we thank you for this day, and we give all praise and honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Terry. Come, Holy Spirit.
I was re prepared to hear the words that the Lord has put on Pastor Terry's heart today and convey to us. May we just open up our our soul. May we open up our hearts and our souls just to to hear these words, Lord, and, and just so that we may be just that much closer to you. That that Pentecostal fire that is still alive today might just burn a little bit within each of us today as you surround us with your presence. to hear God's word this morning. While the worship team was singing, God said, I don't care that you guys put on your microphone. I don't care that you forgot the order and the way things were supposed to be going. I need you to surrender to me and just let me So this morning as we prepare to hear God's word, Father, we surrender to you. We surrender to your authority. We put all the things that are going on in our lives at your feet and give you control over it, Father, knowing that we ultimately don't have control over so many things. Father, we don't have control over whether we get sick. We don't have control over whether someone pulls out in front of us and we end up in an accident. Father, we don't have control over so many things. But Father, you are already in that moment and already there to receive us, Father. So let us rely solely on you. Let us hear your words this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So over the past few weeks, we've been exploring in this series the statement, who God is says you are. The first week, we, Pastor Mark taught us, uh, and in, in his message, it was, who are you? And he, he explored who we are in Christ. And then that next week, I, the message I brought was, you are broken. We are all broken. No one of us is left out of that. And last week, Mark brought us a message that we are chosen. No matter what, we are chosen. God loves us that much. So today, uh, as we get ready to hear the, the message, if you've got your Bibles, uh, we're going to be in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. And then and a little while later, then we'll be in Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. And the first... I want to ask the question. This is rhetorical, so nobody needs to raise their hand or answer it. But think about this. What does it mean to surrender? Now, I looked it up because I wanted to see what the dictionary had to say. And dictionary.com defines surrender this way. It says, to give oneself up as into the power.
power of another. Submit or yield. Now, oftentimes when we think of surrender, we think of uh, in terms of military battles. Because that's, you know, we need the white flag. That's how they, that's what we grew up thinking, you know, in, in thinking of surrendering. And so one army, seeing that they will ultimately be defeated, will surrender to their enemy. They counted the cost and found that it would be less uh, costly to surrender than to continue the fight. And they would lay down their weapons and let the other army take control of them. Now let's put that in terms of surrendering to God. We are letting go of our plans, understanding that the cost is too high for us to continue in our own power. So we're laying down our weapon, and our weapon is sin, because that's what, if, if we're against God, it's because of our sin, so we're laying that down. And then we're letting God work in our lives, we're letting Him guide our steps and direct our decisions. In other words, we're giving Him control, just like in a battle, the army that surrenders gives the enemy control over them. Now you see, it's God's desire to have a relationship with us. And whether we choose to seek Him out or not, God continues to seek us. That, that was a lot of what Mark's message was last week, because God chose us. So, He seeks us. He pursues us. He wants us. He loves us, and He has a gift of forgiveness for us. And that's a gift, so a gift means free. We don't, it doesn't cost anything. He just gives it freely. And, and, and His love is free, His mercy, His grace, His forgiveness, it's all free. Now this morning we're going to look at two very different people. In the passage in John, in the first part, we're going to be talking about Nicodemus and, and his interaction with Jesus. And then later we'll talk about Matthew, or Levi, uh, as he was also called. Now, Nicodemus actually goes to seek out Jesus, but Jesus would seek out Matthew. And here's the thing. They were, it was done differently in both instances. Nicodemus came to Jesus in the dark of night. And there's a lot of reasons behind that, but the biggest one is he was a Pharisee. And coming to Jesus and seeking him out for his teaching meant it was going to cause quite a commotion with the other Pharisees. And see, Jesus, the reason for that is Jesus was at odds with the Pharisees. Um, he didn't fight with them. He used God's word. He used words. He to basically teach what was what they were teaching was incorrect, and, and you know they were very much about themselves, and they saw him as a troublemaker, both for his teaching and for his hanging out with sinners. You know, we we hear him hanging out with prostitutes, the the adulterous woman. I can still see the image from the, the Passion of Christ movie where he was just. On the ground. And he says, He who would has no sin has the first stone. And all of a sudden you just hear rock and those stones fall. <coughs> he used God's word to teach. Now, Matthew 23 outlines some of the specific problems Jesus had with the ruling class. I'm going to touch on just a little bit of that. Uh, so Matthew 1, uh, 23 verses 1 through the first part of verse 5, so 5a says this, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you. So he's saying what they're teaching to obey it. But then he says, but don't follow their example. For they don't practice what they preach. In other words, they don't walk the talk. They crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. And 
everything they do is for show. All I can hear in that last part is, look at me. Look what I did. I, I, I'm so, I'm Pharisee. I've got this long flowing robe and this prayer box is hanging from it. I'm going to stand on the street corner and I'm going to pray out loud because I am righteous. And you need to see me. So to say there was friction between Jesus and the Pharisees is an understatement. The Pharisees, they prided themselves on their nearness to God, and they all too quickly pointed out the errors in others. They would have been quick to call me out this morning and say, <laughs> no, you did that wrong. No, you, sh you should have been better prepared. Done what the sermon this morning says. I had not, I was so busy with the mechanics of setting, getting ready for church this morning, I hadn't yet surrendered myself to God. And that, I love this word, and most people don't even, haven't even heard of it. I, I was discombobulated. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it, it's all there was. And, and, and there's, I take no pride in that. I mean, I just simply, I wanted things to be perfect for worship. And, and it, it happened. And, and it, I'm past it now. God is in control. And I surrendered to Him. I, I was able to get down on my knees and just surrender before I got up here again. And, and so, this is the background that we needed. For this passage. This is the background on Nicodemus and a little bit on Matthew. So let's start by turning to John chapter 3. All right. This is how it starts. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. And after dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. He said, Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evident, or evidence that God is with you. So, Nicodemus is in that searching mode. He hasn't written off Jesus as the troublemaker that the other Pharisees have called him out to be. And so he's, I would say he's like, uh, but here, what, 10, 20 years ago, they would call a seeker in church. People who are seeking God, who are, who are curious, but yet don't have a relationship. They know who he is, but they don't know him. And he ultimately felt like Jesus had some answers to his questions. And he was seeking to, to learn. And in here, he even says, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. So he is acknowledging that Jesus was sent by God to bring a message. Because if we look back, God's messengers were often given the ability to do miracles, which Jesus had already been doing miracles. So he was seen by Nicodemus as a messenger. But here, in this instance, he still misses the mark because he's not really understanding who Jesus is. And the only way that he was going to learn was he was going to have to have an open heart and an open mind to, to hear and to, to listen to what Jesus has to say. It is, it is then that us, just like Nicodemus, it's then that we can learn the truth that, that Jesus teaches us about God. And I think, you know, he came at night uh, in part, uh, you know, because of the uh, not wanting the other Pharisees to see him and not wanting to cause that commotion. But I think there's a deeper meaning here about not wanting to be seen. Because think about this. What do we associate with, with nighttime? You don't want to go out at night. You don't want to go to certain places at night because of evil, because of the untruths, because of the unbelief. Darkness has a very ominous tone to it. That's why when we were in Paris back in 
for you. They told us, you know, when you're on the subway during the day, please do not go to this station, this station, and this station when you're on the subway. But when you're when when you actually sneak out with a couple of friends that you met on the trip and it's two in the morning and you're at those stations, we didn't think anything about it. We forgot everything that we had been told. We just were there. We were enjoying the time down there, learning about you know what was going on at night. There was hardly anybody there. We weren't scared. We were foolish. Just as the world is foolish because it doesn't know the message that God has for us. So it's Nicodemus was living in the darkness of the world and in coming to Jesus, even at night, he was encountering light. Because Jesus is the light of the world. And what Jesus tells him next requires surrender. Okay? So Jesus tells him in, in verse 3, he says, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And in verse 4, Nicodemus says, What do you mean? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? So how many times have you been in a conversation, and you're talking to someone, and you completely misunderstand what the person is telling you? Been there, done that. <laughs> More times than I care to admit. It happened yesterday. It happened the day before. It happens all the time. And so, uh, the one thing that comes out of that for me is embarrassment because I didn't hear. It wasn't. I was hearing the words, but I wasn't truly listening to what was being said. And, and Jesus wasn't talking about this with her. You know, when I first read this as a as a new Christian, and, uh, or even as a child when I was growing up in the church. I was probably just like Nick Demons, but um, what? Born it again? Nick Demons wasn't understanding that Jesus was talking about spiritual rebirth. And here's the thing my study Bible tells me that this was just another way that Jesus used something that uh, is called ironic misunderstandings as a teaching method. So we all know what our idea we all understand what a misunderstanding is. He uses ironic misunderstandings to teach. It makes us really think, and, and we have to really listen to understand what he says. What he is saying is that we must be reborn from above. So spiritually transformed, renewed, or, and, and sanctified. That's what he is what he's really telling us. And without this renewal, we cannot see the kingdom of God. So this is what uh, Jesus says now in verses 5 through 8. Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but only the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants. Just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. So, back to verse 5, and we kind of mentioned this on Wednesday night, being born of water and the Spirit, it's very much misinterpreted. And we got to think back to those ironic misunderstandings that I mentioned before. So it's, it's been linked to the water of baptism. But Christian baptism had not yet been instituted yet. And to Nicodemus, it would have had absolutely no meaning in that context. So then we go to the next thing here. There's nowhere in the scriptures that Jesus makes baptism a requirement for salvation. So my understanding comes from different places throughout the scriptures. Because Mark and I are always saying, Mark said it last week, read around it, read through it, read and, and study it. And so let's go back to Isaiah 44, verse 3, where the prophet says, For I will pour out water to quench your thirst and to irrigate your parched fields. And 
then he says, I will pour out my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your children. And then in Ezekiel 36, 25 and 26, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. Your filth will be washed away and you will no longer worship idols and I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you and I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. So here the terms water and spirit are literally tied together to the pouring out of God's spirit, ultimately now and in the end times. And as a teacher himself, being so well versed on the scriptures, Nicodemus should have realized this, but yet he was still misunderstood because he wasn't listening. And, and this point is further emphasized in Mark chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. So I, John said, it says, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. One day Jesus came from, the Nat, from Nazareth in Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan. And as Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart and the Holy Spirit descending upon him like a dove. And then let's jump to Titus 3, 4 through 7. Paul writes, when God our Savior revealed his kindness and his love, he saved us, not because of his righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior. And because of His grace, He made us right in His sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. So, lightening the pouring out of water to quench our physical thirst and that of the earth, God's Spirit will quench our spiritual thirst. So, it's, it was meant more as a, a metaphorical that his, that water that was being poured out was his spirit being poured out. And, and in the scriptures, we also read uh, Jesus saying, when he said to the woman at the well, I will give you water that will give you eternal quenching of your thirst. And she wanted that, and she got that. And it, there was no physical water given, but he gave his spirit that came upon her, and she understood he was the Messiah because of his teaching to her. So let's go back to verses 6 through 8, where it emphasizes that salvation is the work of God. And we can physically give birth. I can. But you ladies can. But God is the only one that can give us spiritual life. A spiritual birth. And the use of wind shows that we have no control over the Holy Spirit. We try to harness the wind with, you know, the, the fan of the windmills and stuff to, back in the day it was to bring water up out of the well, now it's to produce electricity. We try to harness it, but we can't do anything with it. Look at the derecho last August. We had no control over it. All we could do is basically watch. And so when the Holy Spirit comes into us, and we allow him into us and, and we can we just watch what he does through us. He will change us. And that's what that spiritual rebirth is about. And the one thing that physical birth and spiritual birth have in common, they're both gifts from God. They're both gifts from God. And and still, even through this, as Jesus is talking to him, I gotta imagine the look on Nicodemus' face is one of just he was stumped. Still didn't understand. And, and so in verse 9, it says, How are these things possible? Nicodemus asked. And Jesus replied, You are a respected Jewish leader, and yet you don't understand these things? I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And as Moses lifted up the broad snake on a pole in
14. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on the pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. And this is another point where I need to surrender. God gave me the message. I know it's on those missing pages. Here's the thing. So Moses lifted up the bronze snake. And they were in the desert because the Israelites had sinned. And God had sent a plague of serpents. And the only way that they could be saved was to look up at the serpent, that, that bronze serpent that Moses had lifted up. So now we fast forward to, to what Jesus is about to do. And what do we do? Moses is holding a pole with a bronze serpent hanging from it. We look up to Jesus on the cross. And what happens? We are healed. We are given eternal life through that. And then it continues. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son. So that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. So just like he sent, he gave Moses the bronze serpent, he gave us Jesus. And I love this. It says, and this, people get this all discombobulated. I'm going to use that again. All the time. Because when they're looking this, they're saying, well, Jesus didn't come to judge, but he didn't come to judge the first time. His first time here was to teach us. It was to prepare our hearts. It was to prepare us. It was to give us the opportunity to seek the kingdom. Now, when he comes again, he will be coming to judge the world because when he comes again, that's pretty much it. Our opportunity to choose to have that relationship with him will be done. And so that's why it's so important. That's why it, 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 it breaks our heart to see someone who doesn't know Jesus, who or who doesn't walk the talk. They say all the right things, they try to do all the right things, just like the Pharisees did. And yet, they don't know God, they know who he is. Demons know who God is, but they don't know him. Okay? So, uh, when I first met Diane, I knew who she was. And we won't talk about that. But I didn't know her. I didn't know who she was. I didn't. I hadn't taken the time to, to really get the opportunity to know her. But a relationship started to be built, a friendship, and that ultimately has now led to you know nearly 21 years of marriage, almost 23 years together. It led to that. Now, I knew who God was. I grew up in the church. So many of us did. Some of us didn't. But I grew up in the church. I had that opportunity. But I didn't truly know God until I surrendered. When I allowed Him in. And He wasn't judging me. He knew everything that I had done, every thought I had had, every word I had said. And yet He still sought me out. He didn't judge me. He loved me. And that's what that's why He sent Jesus. To die on the cross. That's why it says he gave his one and only son so we wouldn't perish. He goes on to say in verse 18, there is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people love the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it, for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see what they
they are doing that God wants. I've talked to so many people over the years about God, and they want nothing to do with Him because they're enjoying living in their sin. They know life to, they see life as finite. When it ends, it ends. Either you're cremated and, and become dust right away, or we were put in a casket and we, it will, will decay and become death. There's nothing else after that for them. But here's the thing we know better. We know what God is. We know the hope that is there. And God wants us to share that with so many others. And it's People, I hear the cars and the, the motorcycles and, and going behind me. I can see people riding their bikes via the, the back window there. And I think, do they know Jesus? Have someone ever extended an invitation to church? And we've said this before. People who are asked to church will go more often than not. But if they're never asked... So why aren't we asking? We need to surrender to God and we need to ask. So here we've got Nicodemus. He is still not quite getting it, but his heart is beginning to change. And over that change, we'll see some things happen because uh, eventually he will um, go with Joseph of Arimathea. He's going to bring the spices and aloes with Joseph when Jesus is buried. He goes to honor Jesus' death, which is something that the other Pharisees don't do. And in fact, when they, before they uh, arrested him, and uh, think about the, uh, the they had sent the, the soldiers to go and try and trick Jesus. And what Jesus said just completely and profoundly blew the guards away and they came back without it and the Pharisees lit into them what you we told you what to do and yet you come back but Your what, soul has no doubt of that. what he said just completely blew us away we've never heard teaching like that and what happens next? Nicodemus steps in there and says, is, 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 is it fair to condemn a man without a trial? He stood up to the other Pharisees, even though he might be chastised for himself. And Diane and I, we like to watch a show called SWAT. I, I watched the original series when I was a kid, and I, as in, and I watched the new one, it's a procedural, but um, one of the officers witnessed some other officers and the racial slurring and the racial profiling that they were doing, and he secretly recorded them and he turned them over to IA. And now he is being just chastised, he's being belittled because of what he did. That's what Nicodemus was going, to, was going to face because of what he did. Yet he still goes with Joseph of Arimathea to give Jesus a proper burial. We don't know what happened to Nicodemus. But I have to, to, I have to wonder, will we see him when we go to heaven? I have a good feeling that we will. That's just me. There's nothing in here that says it. I want to be clear about that. But he was on the right path to getting there. Let's talk about Matthew. Let's go to chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. And this is what Matthew wrote. Okay, Matthew's even writing about himself. 
So Jesus calls Matthew, is what this section is titled, and it says, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. And they say, he started to read this. First thing that came to mind was Zacchaeus. And then as I was writing, of course, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man, he started playing through my head. But he was a tax collector too. So Jesus talks to more tax collectors than just Matthew, but he, he, saw, he said, follow me and be my disciple. Follow me and be my disciple. And so Matthew went back, he got up and he followed him. And then later Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? And when Jesus heard this, Jesus had really good hearing. When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Jesus sees Matthew in his tax collector's booth and without hesitation, follow me, be my disciple. Now, Matthew had to have had some knowledge of who Jesus was because he didn't hesitate. He got up and he followed him. This in and of itself would have been scandalous just for Jesus to say hi to him. But Jesus says, follow me. He, Matthew was despised. He was a tax collector. Now, tax collectors at that time, when they were contractors for the Roman government, and they, the government would take the highest bidder, whoever paid the most taxes for. And then on top of that, then the tax collectors would add their commission. And the most evil of tax collectors would put a greater burden on people, and they would pocket that profit. These were Jews, the tax collectors were. And the people they were profiting off of were their brothers and sisters, their aunts, their uncles, their fellow Jews. And they were also despised because well, the Romans were Gentiles, and they hung around the, the Romans because they had to go and give them the money, and they had to get their orders from them, and things like that. And then on top of that, throw in the idolatrous symbols on the coins. Think Caesar said on the coin. That, that, those three things were just part of the reason that they were so despised. is so overwhelmed by this that he tells Jesus, you need to come to my house and have dinner. We need to come together and have dinner. And, and so Jesus went. And at this dinner were other tax collectors, because who else is a tax collector going to hang out with but other tax collectors? So nobody else is going to want to hang out with them. And any other sinners. There might have been prostitutes there and all kinds of manner of other what the society saw as sinners. And Jesus going there, just talking to him, scandalous stuff, he went and had dinner with him and all these others. More scandal. More reason for the Pharisees to boil up in hatred and want to arrest him. And that's why they said, why does your teacher eat with such scum? They didn't mince words on how they felt about these people. And they were constantly constantly trying to trap Jesus. They were so worried about appearances. I know you all want to be out right now, or sorry, right now, but it's all good. They were worried about appearances. They are so narcissistic. It's all about me, 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 man. All about me. And, and as I think about that, 
have had, have you ever been asked to hang out with someone who others eh, didn't really care for? Others didn't really care for. What, what were your reasons for not hanging out with them? Well, my friends would see that and they would, no, I'm not just my friends. Um, what excuse would you have made? Or what excuse did you make? I can think of a few for myself. And it all was about appearances. The Pharisees were more concerned about their appearance. They were more concerned about appearing holy. They would rather criticize than encourage. They had not yet, Barnabas hadn't yet come onto the scene yet, but Barnabas, if you remember, is known as an encourager. They had all the things going wrong. They, they, their thought process was, Jesus, well, think of it this way, the churches that are worried that if a new church starts up, they'll steal their people. Or if you're, uh, say you're a youth pastor, and one of your youth goes with a friend to another church, oh no, I was thrilled that they were getting fed. I didn't care. Because you know what? Some of the kids in this group that I got to lead, they brought friends. And it's interesting to see where those kids are today. In fact, one of them brought, brought a friend is now going to church with that friend, and they're both in their late 20s now. But that young man is still serving in a church. He runs their sound. <sighs> to see that, that's what we want. It doesn't matter. We have y'all here. We have y'all online. People will be watching it after the fact. People will be going to other churches and watching our our our, our service later in the week to get more. Praise God that they're that hungry for the word. But they were so narcissistic. But Jesus didn't make any excuses when he responded to the Pharisees because he's he just put it as plain as can be. He said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick do. Think about this. When Jesus was with the lepers, did he get leprosy? When Jesus was around those with any other disease, did he get that disease? Likewise, when he was around sinners, did he sin? He did not. Being around sinners was not going to make him a sinner because he had the Father in him and he was in the Father. That's where we need to be when we surrender. And he reminded them of the scripture that says, I want to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. So by eating with sinners, Jesus was showing those sinners mercy. He was showing them God's love. He was saying, this gift of forgiveness is there for you. All you need to do is surrender. And this is so different because the Pharisees, they wanted separation. Like, not to make fun of the pandemic, but six feet, please. They want to just keep that distance. They did, because heaven forbid that disease or, or that sin would wear off on them. Somebody else's sin is not going to wear off on you if you are in Christ, if you have surrendered. The Pharisees' true condition was shown by Jesus over and over again. And this is just one passage where it happens. And, and not one of us is good enough. See, we all need God's salvation. And it starts when we surrender. So here's a couple points for you to take away today. No one is too far from forgiveness. Neither the Pharisees, Jesus so frequently criticized, nor the tax collector everyone assumed was beyond hope. No one. And he used 
the Pharisees because they were the leaders, and he used the tax collectors because they were pretty much, well, you think of sinners, think of a sinner, and the sinner, the gum on the bottom of the sinner's shoe, that was the tax collector. They were the pretty much considered the lowest of the low. And so that whole spectrum, everyone is uh, not too far from forgiveness. And throughout the New Testament, the Pharisees would put heavy burdens on the people, and they would just intensify their condemnation of those people. But Jesus put God's love into proper perspective. Verses 16 and 17, once again, from John, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And God sent his Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Again, Jesus' words get through to Nicodemus. Remember, I talked about the Pharisees mocked the guard, but he stood up for Jesus, and then he would go, uh, and he would say, and the passage that it came from was John 7, 15, 51, where he basically said, is it legal to convict a man before he is given a hearing? Now, Nicodemus, in the scriptures, he doesn't leave the world, he doesn't leave what he's doing to follow Jesus, like Matthew did. But something was changing him. And that point number two, when God chooses us, he changes us. When he chooses us, he changes us. Matthew followed Jesus. He just got up and he became a disciple. Nothing proved Christ's power to compel a person like the most wretched sinner being made right. So, Matthew, remember Nicodemus sought Jesus. Matthew didn't. Nicodemus came at night. Jesus did it in the daytime where everybody could see it. So where does that leave us? It leaves us redeemed. When we surrender, we are redeemed. And being redeemed means that the should always it should always be looked at with the deepest and most significant of theological terms, redeemed. Because once we're redeemed, we are God's. And let's boil it down. What we're left with by being redeemed is we're changed. I'm not the same person I was before I surrendered. 100%. Not the 20%. Oh, I'll do it on Sundays and Wednesday nights at youth group type thing. Fully 100%. Seven days a week. 24 hours a day. We are called and chosen by God so that we can be changed through faith in Christ. And the goal, according to Paul's words in Romans 8 29, is for us to be conformed to the image of his Son. So for people like Matthew, considered the worst element in society, being transformed is it's like becoming like Jesus and is the ultimate picture of redemption. And if Nicodemus indeed, indeed came near as one who had been tricked into believing he was part of the grand solution for Israel rather than the root of the problem, which is again a beautiful picture of redemption. No matter what, We've done where we've been. We're not surrendering to God because we're losing. When we surrender to God, it has a completely different meaning. It means we win. It means we get eternal life. Now, everybody gets eternal life. It's a matter of where that's going. Revelation tells us the lake of fire. I really know. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, and, and they talk about heaven being having streets of gold. I, I've said this for years. I'm okay if, if my job in heaven is taking a toothbrush and scrubbing the gold toilet. I'm good with that. I don't care what I, where I, what I do when I get to heaven. But I do want to. Spend eternity with my Savior.
Sandra and others who believe like we do. In paradise. Jesus called it paradise. Remember, he's on the cross, and the, the thief says, Jesus, remember me. This very day, you will be with me in paradise. A paradise is going to be something greater than anything that we can even imagine. Because when we think of paradise, where we think of palm trees, white sandy beaches, and, and the warm ocean, right? Yeah, well, that's many of us do. Some of us might think it's you know, mud riding, or you know, it, it can be anything to anybody, but paradise is going to be beyond anything we can possibly imagine. And we want you to join us there. So, Father God, we pray that people would hear your message and that they would hear it through our, 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 our ministry. And not just the, through the pastors, not just through the sermons or the Wednesday night studies or through the music, but through your people, Father. That your people would be your word and your love and they would show people the hope that they have and that would get those people that have those stony hearts, Father, that they would turn to a heart of flesh and they would be open to hearing that word. And Father, let us be prepared, as the scripture tells us, let us be prepared to give an answer as to the hope that we have in you. Father, you want none of your children to perish. And you certainly don't need us bring your word into this world. But Father, we want to serve you. And by serving you, Father, we want to bring glory to your name by showing others who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, just before Jesus goes into the garden of Gethsemane, and he surrenders to God and says, not my will, but yours. And that's the same thing we need to say to God. Not my will, Father, but yours. He had a meal with his disciples. And it's in that meal that he shared what was about to happen. Again, back to the way Jesus liked to teach. He picked up the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. In the same way, and later in the meal, he fills the cup. So this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you in the sins of many. Take and drink. And he reminds us that as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we have to do that until he returns. We don't know when that's going to be. A lot of people want to try to guess. There seems to be a lot of signs that he's going to be coming back soon. But those signs have been coming since he was here. <laughs> Jesus will come when it's God's time. Because he doesn't want anyone to miss out on the opportunity to choose him, to surrender to him. So let that be your thought as you eat this bread and drink this cup. Father, thank you for what this communion meal means. That is a representation of what your son did for us. Let us never forget that it's by his sacrifice, your sacrifice, that we are redeemed. Let us surrender to you each and every day, Father, in Jesus' name. also, just like everyone else. So pray for me this week, Lord. <laughs> 
everybody. <laughs> and I'll pray yeah. for no one else. And is there anyone that would ask for prayer this week? Okay. Then I've, I've, written, pe I've written people down. So um, God just laid it on my heart this week. Matthew 7, 7, 8. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. So Father God, we come into your presence this morning, praising your holy name. For you alone are God. We thank you for all that you have done and are going to do in our lives. We pray the blood of Jesus wash over Denny. Cleanse his blood and restore him to health, Lord Jesus. We also ask for healing for Lori's knee, that it will be healed in Jesus' name. And we ask for safe travels for Lori and Mark. Protect them wherever they go this week and bring them back safely. Help them to have a joyous trip, Lord Jesus. We ask for healing for Becky. We thank you for the answers that you have given her. And we pray that you will watch over her, protect her, and give her healing. We, we thank you, Lord, for answers for Antonin. And I pray you heal him and walk with him daily and strengthen him and give him hope for each day. Thank you, Jesus, for Steve and Larry, Jen, and Jamie. You know their needs, Lord. Lift them up. Wash them in your Holy Spirit, Father God. And just be with them and comfort their hearts and their minds, Lord Jesus, and mine too. As we fix our eyes on you, Father God, comfort all of those who need your help. Lord Jesus, the ones online listening, just be with them. Comfort us all and hold us with your mighty right hand. That we can walk through fires and floods. That we will not drown in our own sorrows. Because we are children of the Most High God, and you have already paid the price, the highest price, to save us and give us salvation. We are saved by the blood of Jesus, and we are washed by you. And by your stripes, we are healed, Lord Jesus. Help us to surrender daily to you, Father God. Surrender all that we have in our mind that's troubling us, Lord Jesus, so that we can walk each day in hope and joy that you have provided for us each and every day. In Jesus' holy name, I pray this. Amen. Thank you. Ladies, I don't want, I don't think Terry really meant to put the added uh, stress on us today, but he would like perfection. <laughs> I, I mean, he wants to strive for his own. Uh, you know, he has a loving heart, but he'd like our name to just step up just a little bit. I'm forgiven because he was saved. I'm accepted.
fun. Can't you dance to you tonight, everybody? Let's stand up and let's have a little fun. <laughs> Jesus loves you. This I know.
obeying Jesus, by surrendering to him now, we give him dominion over our current lives. But we also give him and put him in charge of our eternal destination. Paul says this in Galatians 2.20, he says, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. For I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. For if keeping the law could make us right with God, there would have been no need for Christ to die. Father, we just thank you that if we surrender to you, that our destination is secure. There's no delay. It'll be in your time. But there's no, there's no flight delays. There's no detours. There's no, there's no distraction. Father, you have control. Father, let us let the Holy Spirit work through us as we surrender to you. Let us reach out to others share that same hope and love that we have gotten from you, Father. And Father, as we prepare to leave this place, Father, I use the scriptures from, from the letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians in, in verse 6, or in chapter 6, um, verse 23 and 24, where he writes, Peace be with you, dear brothers and sisters, and may God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you love with faithfulness. May God's grace be eternally upon all who love our Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Peace. 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 Peace.